In 2022, the Compass Outreach Program was established via some funding from the Department of Industry, Science, Energy and Resources, the Safer Communities Fund. Run by Vinnies, it was a life-changing youth support program, but it's now going to have to close due to a lack of government funding. Professor Lisa Wood can tell you more. The Institute for Health Research at the University of Notre Dame. Professor, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Unfortunately, it has become an issue which has been exacerbated in our community, particularly in the last two or three years, homelessness in our society. For sure. I mean, I honestly, I don't think me or the sector have seen a time that's worse in terms of homelessness. Um, not only people new to homelessness with cost of living pressures, but also um, existing people not able to get housing. And there's a whole ripple effect of homelessness in terms of mental health, justice system, um, child protection and so on. And the program that you're talking about is with, uh, you know, the most vulnerable of the vulnerable in terms of young people who are homeless, often under the age of 18 in terms of who this program has supported. So we're effectively talking about young people or vulnerable children who've been assisted through the Compass program, which was established in 2022. What does it do? What's the program and how's it been successful to date? Yeah, so we've been um, evaluating the Compass program since it began and I have to say there's nothing more depressing than being a researcher that evaluates something, sees that it has an amazing impact and then hears that um, it's not going to continue. I mean, the, these are young people who have just not had the supports and opportunities that most young people their age can take as a given and I've got three young adult sons so I, I, I really feel for them personally as well as through our research. So at the heart of Compass, it is really supporting young people to have hope. And you've got to think that these are people who've grown up in fractured families. A lot of them have had family violence, foster care, um, other experiences. It's just not, they haven't had that opportunity to have hope or to be supported with basic uh, living skills and to see that they have choices. So the program is really led by what the young people themselves want and what they can see for their future. So sometimes it starts with small baby steps mm. like, you know, getting a computer or getting the, the materials to be able to go to school, um, helping them find safe accommodation, connecting them to counselling and mental health support, helping them get a CV, helping them think that something like TAFE might be possible. A lot of them have never even thought that maybe they could go on to do some further study. Um, as well as basic living skills. So all of those things are really, it's really a program about prevention. And I've, I've got to say that, um, you know, the, the government and society spends billions of dollars each year once people are caught up in the revolving door of whether it's the health system, the yeah. justice system, welfare, unemployment, uh, and so on. And this program, for a relatively short, small amount of money, is actually helping to prevent that um, revolving door. So, I, I, you know, I guess what our results are showing is that it's really cost effective, even just in the 16 months it's been going in terms of uh, savings to government. And, and that's just at the beginning when you think about this is preventing young people yes. staying stuck in homelessness and so on. So, yeah, it, it, it's heartbreaking to see it close. But I think it's devastating for the young people who are being supported at the moment, as well as other young people who could be getting helped you know, tomorrow if it was to continue. If it's one thing to put your hand up and ask for help, but it's another thing to find a place that can provide that help and that assistance. And uh, without trying to mix the two issues together, about 45 minutes ago, we're talking about the alcohol sales restrictions being introduced into Broome and Derby. And Peter Peck from the Liquor Stores Association said, we cop that, but there's got to be a range of support services around the people who are affected by this. And that's the message that we hear time and time and time again, whether it's people with mental health issues or in this circumstance, people who are homeless, that they need help, they need assistance, they need programs being put in place. Here, Professor, we have a program that is working. It's only been in place, as you say, for 18 months, but your results speak for themselves. You know, you are helping people create meaningful existence and meaningful lives and provide that safety net or that assistance that they've been crying out for. Why in the world would we get rid of it or not fund it? Uh, that, that beats me as well. And I think this is the challenge that there's a lot of rhetoric from um, governments, um, federal and in the various states and territories around. We need evidence-based programs and we need outcomes. And so it's tragic when a program is showing outcomes that we have this situation. And I think the, these young people are so vulnerable. So 
as a society, we're deeply concerned about what we're seeing with family and domestic violence at the moment. Yes. You know, many of these young people have experienced that. We're deeply concerned about mental health and suicide. Many of these young people are at deep risk of that. You mentioned alcohol um, supplies. I mean, often for these young people, they're self-medicating with alcohol and other substances because of the trauma they've been through and not able to access support. And I think the unique thing about this program is it's run out of two day centre hubs, um, passages in Peel and Perth, where young people can go there and they're not, even if they don't ask for help verbally, you know, it's a safe space. They might hear or see other young people chatting to someone, a caseworker or a peer worker. Um, It's a safe space that they can go. And I think this is the kind of slow, gentle way that Passages has um, set itself up to, to work for young people who are otherwise falling through the cracks. So these, these are not the young people that are going to have the parents saying, mm. we need you to get to the GP or we need to get you to the school guidance officer. I mean, these are young people who are doing it tough, mm-hmm. doing it on their own, living in a bush or whatever. They they need someone to back them and to, and to help them see a different future. And that's what Compass has been doing. Professor Lisa, would I appreciate your time today? Thank you very much. Thank you for your interest in this important issue. It is a really important issue and I appreciate your time. She's been evaluating the success of Compass. Here's a personal testimonial from somebody who's been in it. They say it really helps when you have people who believe in you and they want you to succeed because it makes you feel better. It makes you feel like you can do it. They have helped me so much. Another says Compass has helped me get into my TAFE course and then through the TAFE course it's been talked about a few times and I might have a job lined up at the end of all of it. That's the only two problems I really had, accommodation and employment. They basically got solved or are being solved by Compass, literally life-changing. Couldn't have asked for more, to be honest. We've got to put value on that, accommodation and employment. Now, Suzanne Rooney is the CEO of Vinnie's that has been operating this and she joins me live today. Suzanne, good afternoon. Good afternoon. How are you? Well, I'm I'm getting pretty frustrated by having a chat there to <laughs> Professor Lisa Wood and just hearing about all this good work and thinking it must continue. Mm, oh, absolutely. For us, it's, it's heartbreaking, really. Um, uh, we got the pilot funding from the Commonwealth, but we've been trying to get funding for passages Perth Hub, which is one of the hubs that's run out of for, I don't know, years and years. And the operating both hubs costs us around about $1.5 million a year. And mm-hmm. Vinnie's covers that. We cover about $1.2 million of that. And we get it from, uh, you know, really generous donors, from fundraising like our CEO Sleepout. And, and as you heard Lisa say, I mean, it's a really safe space and it's a really, really unique space for um, unaccompanied children and young people who are homeless or at risk of homelessness. And the Compass program was something that we saw in terms of outreach. We could take some of the most complex young people, as Lisa told you, most of them were sort of under 18, to um, find that way forward, to be able to, the outcomes are incredible. I mean, just 84% were in a more secure housing option, 82% of the who had an employment goal, found job or work Brilliant. experience. And and those things, we just, they were much better than we thought. But we just can't understand why the state government doesn't fund the passages per time. Because if they did, I could find the funding to keep the compass going. But I can't, we can't, we can't do both. Um, and the numbers are increasing enormously. So um, in between our two hubs, we, we saw last year 640 one young people, and we saw 385 the year before. It just keeps growing yeah. and growing the need. Gee, isn't that a terrible indictment on where we are as a society? So, again, here's a program that works. What you've just told me is four in five people plus are able to find a job and hold it down, and four in five people are able to find plus more permanent accommodation. It works. So my maths off the back of the envelope, and you'll correct me here, uh, Suzanne, if I'm wrong, is you're basically asking for what about three hundred thousand dollars from the state government? Well, just five hundred, actually. Five hundred. So, it's know, not yep. much, though, when we're a state no. with billions of dollars. We're the richest no. state, Suzanne. No, no, it's not. And like I said, for years and years we've tried to fund it, but I have no idea why. We're the only hub that's actually. Um, so there's other engagement hubs. We're the only youth-focused. 
um, one, and we're the only one that's not funded by state government. So if we had that funding, we could keep this going for these young people. It's just, I, mean, I have no other word for it, but heartbreaking and frustrating. What does the Homelessness Minister, John Kerry, or the Minister for Youth, Hannah Beasley, say to you? Well, we met with John Kerry, I met with the Minister, John Kerry, um, about three weeks ago, and he, he, he gave us a sympathetic listening, but I haven't had any response other than that. And I must say, I only met with um, the Minister Beasley um, on, on Monday. She's again very supportive, but um, the funding doesn't sit with her, but she was very um, supportive. Um, but we have, through the Department of Communities and through the Minister, for years applied for funding for passages perth and not received it. So I haven't, I don't know why. So I didn't get a response why. Yeah, it must be like hitting your head against a brick wall with this because, again, it's issues we've been highlighting in the community for years and years, but it's been exacerbated in the last couple of years in particular. And here's yeah. a program that works. And as you just said, 641 people through it last year, 380 odd the year before, and you'll probably unfortunately get above 1,000 this year, I'd imagine, if you could operate mm. at all. Through, through passages, Compass is smaller because it's really, really focused. But if we could have it, a, a passages funded, we could fund Compass. I just have to, I can't, we can't fund both. Finney's is, you know, it's really just a sharing of the cost we're asking for. It really is just, you know, we shouldn't have to carry it alone with these incredibly generous supporters that we have. And we also, passages is run kind of in conjunction with, or certainly um, started with, um, Perth Rotary. And so, you know, we've had, it's been there for close to 25 years and it's just growing and growing and there's more and more programs added. This one, I have to say the outcomes of the city are just surprises and it's just so sad for me to have to make the decision that we can't continue to fund it. It must be so sad. Look, I appreciate you and both Professor Lisa Wood joining us on the program today, Suzanne, and we will continue to follow it up and ask the Minister's questions on your behalf as well. And, and let's just keep our fingers crossed that they might come in at the last moment and say, this is something that's working, because unfortunately it's an issue that's only going to continue to get worse. Yeah, unfortunately it is. Thank you so much. My pleasure. The CEO of Innies WA, Suzanne Rooney, uh, joining us live on 6PR this afternoon. We have a budget surplus of $3.5 billion. We're the richest state. We are the envy of the rest of the nation. The Treasurer, Rita Safiotti, and the Premier, Roger Cook, and before that, Mark McGowan, like to brag and boast and tell the world how good we are. We've got to look after those who are the most vulnerable. And if you've got a program that works for at-risk children, we're talking about vulnerable kids who have nowhere to sleep tonight. They might be in a bush. They might be couch surfing. And they get an 80% success rate of finding permanent accommodation and holding down a job. Come on. We're talking about half a million dollars with a surplus of $3.3 .3 It's not that hard, is it?